Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with a wildlife education video. Uh, if you're new to my channel, most of my videos that I post are about falconry, different uh, techniques for training and husbandry and upkeep and health of birds of prey. Um, but I'm a professional wildlife educator and I train all kinds of animals and recently I've had a lot of people asking about some techniques with parrots and I got thinking about it and I thought well you know maybe it'd be good to share some of those experiences and see how they can help people both in wildlife education and also just people who care for animals at home or rehabilitation or other facilities. So this video is going to be about a totally different approach than mainstream pet keeping about how to keep parrots from biting especially large dangerous parrots and knowing this i think can be very helpful in a lot of different ways so let's take a look at two different things the human side and the bird side uh us we as humans we're social we are tactile uh, we love to touch everything we love to form a connection with an object uh, you think about something like if you go to a monument or something or a special place and like I touched it I was actually here uh, and same thing with our human interactions We we embrace we hold we pat each other on the back. We shake hands. We're, we're used to touching or we're also used to cuddling you think about um, you know a crying baby Okay, we're gonna hold the baby to comfort it and we uh, project that out onto other animals uh, a dog. Oh, we see a dog. We want to pet it. It looks so soft. We want to pet it. And oh, we want to cuddle the puppy. We want to do that to cats. Oh, they're so soft. And then you try it and the cat's like, Rrr! doesn't want to be held. That is human. And it seems to be across the board, all over the world, we have this response. Uh, we like animals, especially higher uh, thinking vertebrate animals. We love forming social and mental connections with these higher animals. And we like the idea of them reciprocating the kind of tactile socialization and physical touch that we enjoy as humans. Um, we selectively breed them as such. A dog breeds that we've selectively bred to be more cuddly and friendly. We love that. And dog breeds that don't like to be touched or held or handled, we're like, oh, they're, they're not a good dog breed. We don't, we don't like that kind of dog because they're not cuddly. It's like, well, they're, they are what they are. It, it, just because something doesn't like to be cuddled doesn't mean that uh, they don't like, uh, that there's something wrong with them. When we come to parrots, parrots are far more complex and intelligent than most people give them credit for. Now, humans are attracted to them. Uh, we love the bright colors, especially. Ooh, they're just like a rainbow of colors. Wow, these bright, beautiful birds. We do love that. Um, and and they're, they're very exotic in many parts of the world. I'm, I'm living in Utah. We don't have parrots flying around here. So the thought of, oh, wow, an exotic tropical bird from the rainforest, it's, it has allure. Um, and then you have in movies that glamorize parrots and, you know, oh, you always have the you know, pirates got a parrot on their shoulder. There's that whole adage, that whole idea that's not very founded in truth. So there's a lot of appeal to parrots. They are very intelligent and so they can talk and many parrot species and individuals absolutely do learn what they're saying, what the meaning of those words are. Now there's all these negative aspects to keeping a large parrot as a pet, you know, things like they can scream and they, they need incredible amounts of attention. Um, I'm not, this video isn't about that. This video is about a technique that works at home, but also in wildlife education to prevent yourself from getting chomped on. Uh, and let's take a look at the parrot's perspective. Don't think of a parrot as some bird from a pet store. Think of them as a fully blossomed, fully developed organism of the wild that live in an environment. And what do they do in that environment? Well, they can fly, of course, which you don't often see. I'm grateful that more and more you are seeing people training their parrots to fly. And there are groups that will go to areas and let them fly in a flock together in these beautiful landscapes such as Moab, Utah, and St. George, Utah, Red Rock Country, and then, then they come back home. Uh, it's really neat to see. It's, it's a healthier way to live. But they fly, and when they go to gather food, they have this enormous beak very terrifying beak. Now I work with um, birds of prey and I have to say I am more afraid of the beak of a macaw than I am the beak of an eagle. Now yes eagles have enormous beaks and yes they bite and can do damage 
but that beak is meant not for killing. They kill with their feet. That beak is there to bite and pull strips of meat off or bite and snap a bone by the power of the neck. So even the largest birds of prey, I am less afraid of their beak than a large macaw. Uh, the beak of a large parrot like a macaw uh, does several things. They use it to, uh, to, to as, as a multi-tool, they use it to bite food and tear it off a tree like fruit or nuts. Uh, they use it to crack open nuts and seeds. I, uh, you look at a macaw breaking open a walnut and it's just nothing. You think how hard that is for us and they just <laughs> like it's nothing. Imagine that's your finger. Imagine that's your bones. This very potentially dangerous bird. Now their feet are very tactile. Parrots can grab things with their feet and just like a hand, but also their beak is a, is a very elaborate, intricate tool that is so delicate they can use it to preen feathers. And their, the, the combination of their beak and the way it can move and their tongue within their beak it almost is like an extra set of hands. They can, in their own mouth, rotate something and take off little pieces. So it's gentle enough that they use it for preening and powerful enough to use it for cracking open seeds and also for biting and carving out um, pieces of wood. They love to tear apart sticks and wood and many parrots nest in hollow trees. And if they find a hollow tree, they'll gouge out and rip out huge chunks of wood and tell that uh, nesting cavity is exactly what they want it to be. These are, this is a very powerful beak. They also use it to climb. They will just climb right up things. Uh, some of my macaws, uh, when they're trying to get my attention, will climb to the top of their cage and hang from their beak alone. Their feet are just dangling and they swing and they're just hanging from their beak alone. So this is a very powerful thing. Parrots greet each other often with a little bit of a bite. They'll come up to each other and they'll and they and it's sort of like a handshake. That doesn't work with a hand and a beak. If a parrot comes up to you and does that, that doesn't work. That's not good. So there's so many ways that a parrot's beak gets used. It's very gentle and it's very powerful. The problem with this is if you have a parrot, a large parrot as a pet, or in wildlife education, is that there's no safe way to manage that. If you're holding them and they decide they want to bite you, you're toast. You can't even wear a glove. If you wear a, a thick falconry glove, even thick enough for an eagle, they can, an eagle's feet, a parrot, a large parrot can still bite through it. So what? how do you safely do it? There's some people who advocate like trying to uh, discipline parrots and to spray them with a spray bottle and stuff. I don't do that. Um, I don't, it, birds, I'm used to training birds of prey and they can only be trained with positive reinforcement. You cannot discipline a bird of prey. And the mind of a parrot may be different than a bird of prey, but it's still a bird and birds do not react well to the concept of discipline. They only react well to understanding and to, um, to positive reinforcement. So the, the problem you have with parrots is that parrots all, left to their own devices are also cuddlers. You look at a pair of parrots, might be uh, siblings that might be uh, uh, a mated pair, and they want to cuddle. They'll, they'll sit by each other, they'll preen each other, and if, if they're preening and cleaning feathers and it gets annoying, then the other one will and will kind of go to bite the other one and the other one has a powerful beak that can withstand that bite and they're like, they express disconcern or they express the term no with a ah! Well, that doesn't work if you are holding them and you're doing something and then suddenly they don't like it and they go to bite you, now you're bleeding all over the place. This is, it's, it's, it, it doesn't line up, it doesn't work. When you watch parents, and you have a mated pair or brother and sister or parent and child. They love to be near each other or snuggled together. They love to preen. They love to be in each other's space. But you never see one of them sitting on the other one, unless they're mating. <laughs> you never see a parrot riding around on another parrot. Doesn't happen. It is not natural. It is not normal. Now with parrots, we often will hand raise them from babies. And so they get imprinted on us. So they're a little confused. They're like, okay, you're family, but you're a human. You're way bigger than me. And what do we want to do? We put on them, oh, I want to hold you. I want to cuddle you. Here, right on my shoulder, I'm kissing you. Oh, and I'm cuddling you. Sit on my lap and I'm petting you. 
and they enjoy that too. They're like, hey, this is fun. This person's carrying me around and I'm cuddling until something weird happens where for whatever reason they're mad at you and they bite you. Or uh, here's, here's a prime example is once they get to uh, sexual maturity and they're like, where's my mate? There are no other parents to mate with. I was raised by humans. You're a human. You must be my mate. So they could have very strange things happen. I have a friend who uh, had a gala cockatoo and that gala cockatoo decided that his upper half was his mate, but the lower half of his body was a threat trying to steal away his weight. So imagine that. So this cockatoo was always riding on him and cuddling and preening and offering him food. Hey, you want to mate with me? You want to be my pair? But then if he moved his legs, then it's like, ah! And he'd go and attack his legs and feet and try to just try to kill him. Because, so this parrot's mind said the upper and lower half of the bodies were separate entities. That doesn't work. You can't have a parent trying to mate with your upper half and trying to kill your lower half. It's, this is not a good scenario. So um, I know there are many different successful approaches to parents. I appreciate that. I respect that. I am sharing one method that works very well, which is to totally eliminate holding a parrot in any normal human way, not holding them on the lap, not holding them on your shoulder or letting them crawl around on you, not even holding them on your hand. You can still pet them, but not holding them. Here's what I suggest and here's what I do in my wildlife programs. So uh, I use uh, little tea perches or something they're called bite sticks. The, when I was first shared with these, I was shown uh, tea perches that were made out of PVC, wrapped around with duct tape, uh, and I was introduced to these by Steve Shingren, which you should look up his uh, YouTube channel if you get a chance. He's a master of falconer and wildlife educator who's world renowned. And he had an amazing wildlife show called the World of Flight Show. And this is what he showed me is with these PVC bite sticks with duct tape wrapped around. So if you are going to do a show and you're going to get a parrot out of the cage, if you put your hand in and they're having a bad mood, they're going to bite your hand. And if they're having a good mood, they'll just come out. Well, instead, he would put in one of these little tea perches, and if they were mad, they'd arr, 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 bite the duct tape wrapping, and they're like, oh, okay, I got that out of my system, I've made my point, and they'd step on, and they'd bring them out with these. And it worked great. Uh, sometimes they would also hold them during flight parts to get them to go. Uh, I started this uh, with, with wooden tea perches, um, and I've loved this. Now, a small one, you know, maybe three feet long, is perfect for getting a bird in and out of a cage. And then uh, uh, if I'm doing a program, then I transfer them to a bigger tea perch that's you know maybe five feet tall, whatever works for you, and has maybe a little hole in it where you can attach little toys, leather things, things that they can rip apart if they're feeling agitated. This is really good system. So let's take a look at how this tea perch idea works. Uh, take a look here. Here is a macaw I recently acquired a few weeks ago. His name is Max. He is a hybrid between a scarlet macaw and a military macaw. And he came to me with a plucking problem and for the family that didn't have enough time for him. So I've been socializing him and getting him used to my forms of training. And the feathers are starting to grow back on his chest. Now, this is a bird that does love to be pet. And... Uh, but yet that can be done, he wants to be socialized. That can be done on a perch of any kind without holding. He loves to have his head feathers rubbed. Uh, he loves to have his, uh, his under his wings scratched. But if he's on a perch rather than my hand, it's easy to do those things. And if he gets mad and rah, wants to lunge out, I can just pull back because I'm not holding him. So then to use a T perch, you present it usually in the front, some parrots prefer it in the back, and a parrot can step on and then they can easily step off. This is a great way to do it. And again, if they are frustrated and don't want to at that moment leave a perch, they can express that frustration by biting it and then stand on. They're like, oh, okay, well, we're, we're going somewhere else. This works really well. Uh, here's another example. I've got uh, a pair of macaws that are on eggs that are about to hatch, but I still have to clean their cage every few days. So the male is very aggressive right now. He's a good bird. His name's Tikal. He wants to attack anything that comes into his cage, but I have to get him out in order to clean the mess down below. And so using a tea perch, 
can get him in and out. And you can see on this, watch how he will get up and go back down with no problem. And then watch if he is mad, he can express that by doing a little bit of a bite, but then he'll still get up because he understands, hey, I want to express my frustration, but I understand we're gonna go back into the cage. This works really, really well. I use these perches as well when I'm doing any sort of a presentation, you just have them right on the perch. And if they're being aggressive, you can hold them a little higher or you can slide the perch up a little higher away from your hand. And if they are in a good mood, then you can walk them close to the guests within a safe distance. Um, and if you have a child reaching out, it's very easy to just lift up the perch away from the parrot's mouth. So I think this is a really great system. I also use little flag stands that I'll put these perches in if I'm not putting them on an actual set perch in, during a show. Now, if you need to get them up or down, you need to put a bird down in a lower place, most parrots, uh, there's exceptions, cockatoos love to root around on the ground, but a lot of parrots don't want to be on the ground. It's a vulnerable position to be in. Their feet are oriented in a way that they don't do well walking on the ground, most parrots. So if you have to set them down low somewhere or on a table, maybe they're at a vet clinic getting a checkup, and you go to put them down and they're like, I don't want to. If they're on your hand, they're going to turn around and keep trying to climb up your arm. And if you keep trying to put them down for the vet checkup, next thing you know, they're biting you. Well, if you have trained them with these T-perch systems, it's very easy to just be like, here you go, you gently get down. And same thing, to pick them up, you gently pick them back up. And anywhere, inside, outside, this system is great. Now, it also works for putting a bird on a high position. Uh, in a lot of the presentations I do, I like to have birds out in high places before the show that way guests coming in they're out of reach so you don't have to worry about people getting hurt but how do you get a bird to go someplace high and how do you get them to go somewhere low uh, also what if you have a bird that gets spooked and flies up to a high place and now they're in a state of alarm how do you get a parrot to come back down if you're reaching up your hand and that's all they ever know then that can be very uh, aggravating and they won't come down but if they know the tea perch it's a perfect way to get them to go to a high place slowly and gently, and to get them to go back down, even if they're a little, what's going on? They are used to that, that T-perch, so eventually they will hop on and get back down. So it works perfectly. So again, this whole idea mentally is about taking the human uh, projection of what we want with an animal interaction away. You're just getting it away and you're doing it more on their terms. You can still pet them on the perch. You can know their limits. Where do they want physical interaction? Where do they want to be pet? Where do they want to be touched? Where do they want to be preened and cuddled? But you're doing it with them not on you. Not on your body, not on your arm, not on your hand, not on your head, uh, somewhere. And that way you both still get that tactile response that you both want. But if they're having a bad moment and go to bite you, they can't do it. And if they need to bite something aggressively, they can bite that perch all they want. And they very quickly learn that this, this is okay. And again, even in extreme examples, like I said, the highly aggressive blue and gold macaw, who's, he's very, T. Call's very upset right now because it's breeding season, he's amped up, he wants to shred anything, but yet I can still use this technique to take him out for a few minutes, give him uh, a couple of treats, let him eat while I clean out his cage and his mate is sitting on the eggs and I can put him back. You cannot normally do that with breeding macaws. You cannot get them out with your hand. You will get shredded to pieces. And yet, this simple technique allows that to happen. So I'm a, I'm a firm advocate of this idea. Again, it's not the only way. There's so many different approaches to parrots, uh, large parrots and macaws. I just wanted to share one that definitely works for me, both with pet large parrots at home as well as with birds that I use in educational presentations. I hope you find this video useful, and I hope that uh, this is a technique that you can implement that will help you at home, or if you're a wildlife educator. Uh, I think it's really good that we have as many good wildlife educating techniques out there that are helpful for the birds, the trainers, and the people watching the presentation. If we're all happy, if we're all healthy, we're all taken care of, 
that's the best case scenario. So uh, I hope you'll uh, leave some comments down below of what other kind of videos you'd like to see. If you hit subscribe, if you haven't already, it really helps me grow this channel. And I hope you'll come back again and see more of these videos. Thanks for watching.